Okay, now we're going to look at the inhibition model just to see how these dynamics unfold over time. Here we have a simple version where we have input going to the hidden layer and you can see that the inhibition over here on the side is represented by separate pools of neurons, these inhibitory interneurons. These are configured so that they actually receive excitation from the input layer, that's the feed forward form of inhibition, and receive excitation from the hidden layer, that's the feedback form of inhibition, and then they send, so we're looking at the receiving weights, R dot weight, into the inhibitory interneurons, this pool over here on the right, and they receive uh, those excitatory projections, and then if we click on S weight, we can see that they send essentially a uniform level of inhibition back to neurons in the hidden layer. So this means that they're going to be opening up those chloride channels on these hidden units here. So this is how we think it works in the brain. If we run this model, we can see dynamically as an input activity pattern comes in, the inhibitory neurons get excited and drive a uh, inhibitory response to the hidden units there. And we can kind of back up through time using our history uh, mechanism and see how that unfolds. So now I will back up to this point here, cycle one, the input has just come in and now we can watch as initially the inhibitory interneurons get activated from this input pattern. And one of the most important things that's happening here is that we've set the parameters for these inhibitory neurons so that they respond more quickly. They have a faster time constant of integration, which is a property of real inhibitory interneurons in the brain. And that allows them to actually get active and send inhibition over to the hidden layer in anticipation of the excitation that's simultaneously coming in from these inputs. Okay, so we can look at the amount of inhibition and excitation coming in by uh, zooming in on the excitatory conductance and the inhibitory conductance. And you can see that there's excitation coming in. And then as a result of these inhibitory neurons getting active, there's some inhibition coming into the hidden layer at this point. Um, even before the neurons get active, you're already getting that inhibitory input. And that, again, is anticipating in this feed-forward way what's going to happen. So we keep going. More inhibition is still kind of resolving and coming in there. And now, finally, we're starting to get this initial wave of activity. And that initial wave of activity is actually now going to drive feedback inhibition. We haven't had any feedback inhibition till this point, but now with this activity coming in, it's driving further excitation of the inhibitory neurons, which is now causing them to produce more inhibition feeding back into that hidden layer. And you'll see an interesting kind of oscillation wave uh, dynamic here where this excitatory input is actually strong enough to drive quite a bit of activity in the hidden layer. And because feedback inhibition is reactive, it, it can only respond to this new wave of activity, it, it causes this characteristic oscillation. And we do see these oscillations in the brain. This is a real phenomenon. But if we didn't have this anticipatory feed forward inhibition, it would be kind of an, an extreme level of this uh, oscillation. So there you can see increased excitation. Now it's driving more excitation of the inhibitory neurons. You get this big wave of activity. And now finally, this increased amount of inhibition is sufficient to start inhibiting those, in, those hidden neurons. They go back down. That takes the pressure off these guys. And you get this kind of classic feedback ringing type of oscillation as the system is kind of now trying to find a balance between the excitatory and inhibitory dynamics. We can, we can see this in the cycle plot, which shows us the uh, oscillations. This is plotting the total amount of activity
in the inhibitory neurons and the um, excitatory neurons. So the inhibitory neurons are shown in red. The excitatory neurons uh, total activity level is shown in black. And you can see this early activation, feed forward activation of the inhibitory population. Then as the excitatory hidden level, hidden layer neurons get active, this initial burst or wave of activity that then drives a corresponding feedback inhibition wave in the uh, inhibitory neurons. That extra inhibition feeds back, turns off the inhibitory, uh, excitatory neurons. And again, then this kind of oscillation is damped uh, because the inhibitory neurons do operate faster. Um, they're able to eventually get on top of this and anticipate those changes and you get a nice equilibrium level. It also turns out to be important, as you'll see when you explore this model, um, that the inhibitory neurons inhibit themselves. And when we go here and look at the total amount of inhibition, now it's quite a bit higher. Um, we can see that uh, these inhibitory neurons are actually sending inhibition to themselves. Again, if we look at the R weight, you can see that they receive inhibition from themselves. And this is actually a characteristic biologically of inhibitory neurons in the brain. They do, in fact, uh, communicate inhibition to themselves, self-inhibition. So now we're going to look what happens when you have bidirectional excitation. In other words, two different hidden layers, which really drives the need for uh, this inhibitory dynamic feedback. So here, we're just going to run the model. Again, we, we present some random input pattern in the input layer. It activates the inhibitory neurons. These then feed back uh, to here, to these corresponding hidden units here. And then we've added the second layer of excitatory uh, hidden layer two that is also receiving its own separate inhibition pool from inhib two. And as happens in the brain, these first layer of excitatory neurons actually receive excitatory top-down projections from hidden two. And furthermore, interestingly enough, the inhibitory pool in the first layer receives a, what we would consider to be technically a feed-forward form of inhibition in the sense that it's not coming from the neurons that it is actually directly inhibiting, but from a different population that's providing input. So even though these are kind of higher level neurons in the, in the hierarchy, in some ways they function technically in the inhibitory domain as a sort of feed forward anticipatory input, telling these inhibitory neurons that as this second layer of excitatory neurons gets active, there's gonna be some additional inhibition that's necessary. So that's a kind of anticipatory, um, maybe a better word to just use anticipatory as opposed to feedback inhibition. And what we see with this model is that it is extremely sensitive. So we can show the, the plot again of the individual levels of activity. And you can see that the inhibitory neurons get the kind of in initial activity, this feed forward inhibitory activity. Then we see the excitatory hidden layer neurons get active, the same kind of feedback ringing oscillation dynamic. And now here we get a second peak of activity that's associated with uh, um, top-down projections coming in. Um, and so the second wave of excitation, the second bump, is all from the top-down hidden layer two neurons, which have been activated from this initial wave of activity uh, feed forward from these uh, first level of hidden neurons. And uh, the system does stabilize out there at this nice level of overall activity, roughly 10 to 15 percent, as we'd expect in the brain. Now, What's really interesting is how sensitive this network is to um, the detailed level of inhibition. And this is where we can understand, for example, phenomena such as epilepsy, um, where small changes, in fact, in these inhibitory parameters can have big consequences. The system has to be very precisely balanced. And so here we have hidden G bar I. Okay, this is the multiplier on the overall level of inhibition that each in individual neuron in the hidden layer receives. And so if we reduce this number just even slightly, so we're going from 0.4 to 0.35, and we try that again, we can see that we get this overflow of activity 
um, this, this kind of epileptic seizure of activity that every neuron in the, in the system essentially gets fully active. And you can see that here in this uh, plot, you get some initial control of the overall uh, feedback. So essentially the feedback inhibition at this point is sufficient to prevent this explosion uh, of runaway activation. But once the top-down inhibition, once the top-down excitation from hidden two comes in, it kind of overwhelms the system, this positive feedback loop, and you get this, you know, epileptic uh, seizure kind of effect. And you can see again that this parameter is highly sensitive as you try out different values of it and try to get back to that uh, original level, you can see, well, just a little bit more inhibition, now it's more under control. So this gives you a sense of, of how important dynamic inhibition is computed by these inhibitory neurons. And what we do in our models is just simulate the effects of this inhibition using equations that essentially directly compute a feed-forward component by taking the amount of excitatory conductance that each layer is receiving and sending, computing directly an amount of inhibition that's a proportion of that GE excitatory conductance coming into each layer. That's the feed-forward component. And then the feedback component is proportional to the amount of activity within uh, the layer itself. And so those directly map onto these components of feed-forward versus feedback inhibition that these inhibitory interneurons compute. We turn on this feed-forward feedback inhibition parameter and run the model, we're directly computing the amount of uh, feed forward and feedback inhibition. These neurons are still there, we're still seeing them, but they're not actually entering into the computation because we've hit this flag. Um, and you can see that the network settles very quickly and stably into this kind of level, overall level of activity. We don't have to deal with the different time constants of activation of these inhibitory neurons. So it may be slightly, again, slightly somewhat less realistic in terms of how the brain actually works, but it's a very simple mathematical comp computation that allows us to run our models much faster than if we had to introduce all this additional synaptic connectivity and additional neurons to simulate. So we typically run this feed-forward feedback inhibition computed uh, directly instead of uh, using these inhibitory interneurons.